Okay, well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name's Neil Ward, I'm Pro Vice Chancellor here, and uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you all to tonight's inaugural lecture. I'm delighted to be introducing Professor Eleanor Nardi, who's Professor of Mathematics Education here at UEA. Uh, Eleanor studied for her bachelor's in mathematics at the Aristotle University in Thessaloniki, yes. <laughs> in Greece. Uh, and uh, she graduated in 1986 before heading to the UK to undertake an MPhil in mathematics education at the University of Cambridge and then a DPhil at Oxford. Uh, she continued to work as a research associate at Oxford and then at, at Warwick for a couple of years and including a few months uh, as an A-level maths teacher before moving to Norwich in 1998 to take up a position as a lecturer here at UEA. Uh, since then, Ellen has been awarded her advanced certificate in higher education practice and worked as a senior lecturer, reader, and as director of research, amongst other positions within UEA School of Education and Lifelong Learning. She's currently the advisory editor uh, of the Routledge Journal Research in Mathematics Education and a member of the ESRC's Peer Review College. Eleanor's research focus is on the teaching and learning of maths at university level and the cognitive, social and affective issues of secondary students' engagement with maths. She's interested in the epistemological and pedagogical knowledge and beliefs of secondary school teachers and the wider representation of maths and mathematicians in popular culture. In 2003, uh, Eleanor launched the Research in Mathematics uh, education group, RME. And the group now includes colleagues with interest in this area from several of UEA schools, not just the School of Education, but the School of Mathematics and, uh, and, and other schools as well. Of particular significance is the group's re relationship with the School of Mathematics and members uh, of the group conduct several collaborative research projects together. Uh, Eleanor is Director of the MA in Mathematics Education at UEA and contributes to PhD EdD and BA programmes within the School of Education and Lifelong Learning, and to date she's supervised 18 doctoral students through to completion. Uh, Eleanor's currently involved in a number of academic projects. She's Principal Investigator of CAP Team, a British Academy funded project challenging ableist perspectives in the teaching of mathematics, and is co-investigator uh, on a UK Research Council funded project on partnerships between schools and universities. She's a contributor to numerous academic publications over the years, and her monograph, Amongst Mathematicians, Teaching and Learning Mathematics at University Level, was published in 2008. So I'd like to extend a, a warm welcome uh, to you all, uh, to those of you visiting uh, UEA from off campus, and to members of Eleanor's family. Really nice to have you here this evening. And I will now ask Professor Eleanor Nardi to present her inaugural lecture. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, friends, colleagues, family. A uh, very warm welcome to everybody for being here uh, this Tuesday evening. Thank you for your presence here today. It is nerve-wracking, of course, to do any presentation of this kind. But worst of all, it's to do it in front of your family for the first time. <laughs> Hello, Mom. <laughs> um, so a warm thank you for, uh, to everybody for, uh, for today's um, uh, for giving your time to be here. Now, this little poster we, we see there, it's from the celebrations we had at UEA for 50 years of UEA a couple of years ago, which coincided with the 10 years of the RMA group that Neil uh, mentioned in his introduction. Um, and it's a group that we launched in 2003. It has now been going on for about 12 years. And a lot of the things that I will be talking about tonight, they will not be starting with the word I, it will be more about the we of the group and the work that I've been doing collaboratively with members of the group and other colleagues in the university and elsewhere. Have a look at the, the little map we have there of the, um, of the world. <laughs> uh, these are just some of the coll collaborations we set up in, in these 12 years and I'm very pleased to say that in the last couple of years we would be able to add a few more arrows in that map. Uh, to add particularly collaborations also with colleagues from uh, Africa and more from South America as well. Um, so what is today's lecture about? Uh, it's based on 
three separate items that I have been involved in recently, each one of them contributing to different parts of the lecture. One is um, this beautiful building you see there in the, in the Black Forest. It's in the Black Forest in Germany. It's in Oberwolfach, a place where mathematicians for several decades have been converging to do a lot of hard maths. And for the first time, it opened its doors to mathematics education at university level last year. I was invited to do one of the lectures there. I was gobsmacked by the invitation, and I was really happy to accept it. It was wonderful to actually address a, 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 an audience of mathematicians and math educators in this environment. Um, so part of what we are going to be discussing today is based on that. Uh, following that presentation, I was invited by the Institute of Mathematics and its Applications to do a paper for a special issue that's coming out in December to talk a little bit about the communities of mathematics and mathematics education and the ways they've been collaborating and to publish a paper in that special issue that's coming out in December. For the more theoretical aspects of what we're discussing today, what is called in that third paper listed there, the community rapprochement between mathematics and mathematics education, is a paper that actually until yesterday, this slide said in press, but 11.30 <laughs> last night, I heard that the, pub, the paper is now published online. So it is now a 2015 paper in Educational Studies and Mathematics. So there is three uh, quite different pieces of writing or presentation that I had to do for the purposes of what um, we're discussing today, which is, can we consider mathematics and mathematics education, the relationship between these two communities, as a story of paths just crossing, or of meeting at a vanishing point. Now, vanishing point is not a term from math. It's mostly coming from the studies of perspective and from architecture. Uh, and I do know that people, of course, it has a mathematical meaning as well. But um, hopefully by the end, what I have to say tonight, hopefully that title will make a bit more sense. So what is the story about today? I will draw on my experiences of collaborating with colleagues from mathematics um, in order to tell a story of paths crossing of mathematicians and mathematics educators intersecting at various points in research, teaching, professional development, and public engagement activities. It's going to be quite a broad story. Um, in this story, I position myself as a non-research mathematician who chose to become a researcher in mathematics education and has been involved in these collaborative activities for about 20 years. And the story will have three parts. The first part, um, what I will do there, I will trace the relationship between mathematicians and mathematics educators, particularly in research. And I'm hoping to offer a potted account of issues that have been helping this relationship grow, grow at a not always satisfactory pace, or occasionally stall. Then it's becoming a bit more upbeat, I think. In the second part, I would like to offer examples of initiatives deepening this relationship from research, from teaching, and from professional development. In the third and final part, um, I would like to offer examples of initiatives where the two communities have been working together towards the st strengthening <coughs> another fragile but very important relationship, that of the public with mathematics. And hopefully I will close with a thought which may explain today's title and answer the so what and the what's next kind of questions. And I believe we have time for a little bit of, for a couple of questions in the end. I was asked whether I'm happy to take questions and I did say only if they're very rude. <laughs> so, um, so, let's go into part one. Let's look at the relationship between mathematics and mathematics educators, mathematicians and mathematics educators. Those of you who know the, the work that I, um, the book that I published and Neil mentioned in his introduction in 2008, Amongst Mathematicians, will probably know that it's, it's about um, a piece of research that took place uh, here in the UK in six uh, UK mathematics departments with extended interviews uh, with mathematicians, colleague, uh, colleagues who teach uh, mathematics and do research in mathematics in six different departments. And that I decided to write up the findings and the analysis from the, that interview study in the rather strange format of a dialogue between two data-grounded but fictional characters, M and RME. M being a mathematician and RME being a researcher in mathematics education. One of the, uh, the focal points of the interviews we had with colleagues of the 20 colleagues who participated <coughs> in the study, was the perceived benefits and obstacles and desires of that relationship between mathematics and mathematics education. And I will be focusing in the next few minutes on that. Reporting such conversations actually is not new. Um, there is a paper by Anna Sfard, for example, 
um, in his discussion with a quite famous mathematician, Simpson Amitsu. It's also written in the form of a dialogue, so Anasfar has been an inspiration in this direction. And there are many people actually like Michel Artic and Jerry Golden, colleagues from mathematics education will recognize those quite important names, who have offered as a common observation that the relationship between mathematicians and mathematics educators has also often been very fragile. And in fact, they decided to dedicate the final chapter of the book called Fragile Yet Crucial, the relationship between mathematicians and researchers in mathematics education exactly to this issue, and glean from the interviews um, and construct the dialogues between these two characters based on what our <laughs> participants have contributed in, uh, in this area. So, um, I mean, roughly speaking, the, chap the final chapter of the book describes how, what benefits the character of M, the mathematician, cites the benefits for pedagogical practice and showing from what? From using the findings of educational research, mostly for the purpose of teaching, and from engaging themselves with educational research. Also, however, how the participating mathematicians often critiqued the practices of mathematics education. And we can sense in these conversations we had the deep, sometimes very deep, um, epistemological differences between the worlds of mathematics and mathematics education. So the critique was about how research in math education is done, how it could be done, how we build theory in research in mathematics education, how we write it up, how we disseminate it. So these are some of the large grant areas that were being focused on in these interviews. So finally, both characters, so participants, um, uh, acknowledged in the study the stereotypical perceptions of mathematics, mathematicians, and, and educational research that often tantalize this relationship. I'm going to actually uh, refer to this chapter as well, the work of uh, Michel Artigue in a book that actually came out um, uh, in 1998, about 10 years before, uh, before my book was published, which had a chapter about uh, how do mathematicians see research in education? What do they see in it? And in fact, some of the things that I'm writing about in the final chapter of the book are about elaborating some of the things that Michelle had actually put in that chapter. Um, the first thing is that our colleagues in mathematics were saying researchers in mathematics education have to stay as close to mathematics as possible. There is a suspicion sometimes emerging out of the explosion of theories in maths education research that methodologically and epistemologically our colleagues in the sciences and the social in, in, in mathematics may not understand or may not have the time or the interest to, to engage with. There is actually a little bit a little bit of a stereotyping there that researchers in mathematics education or didacticians, as Michel Arti calls them, perhaps they're not as good mathematicians as they could or should be. Um, mathematicians may seek help from maths educators, but maths educators cannot always offer that help. For example, Guy Brousseau, a colleague, a very seminar, a leading um, colleague from France, set some criteria for what maths education research should, should be like. It should be um, relevant, it should be immediate, and it should be free from jargon. Um, that's a, a little bit of a difficult one. Um, RME may expose weaknesses of teaching and complicity in a malfunctioning and ineffectiveness of an educational system. It can therefore be unpleasant, sometimes even disturbing, and thus be ignored or be dis disregarded. Perhaps mathematicians may disregard the complexity of learning issues that RME sometimes uh, expresses in a very convoluted manner. It may even become annoying. You know, I've heard many times, you know, how lengthy are your papers? Why are your papers in maths education so long? Um, RME needs to engage more systematically with disseminating its outputs to less specialists but committed, like um, uh, our colleagues from mathematics audiences. At the end, both Michel Artig and both what we found within, in the research we did with, um, with our colleagues from mathematics, with Paola Giannone, for most of the years that the study took place, RME as a field is both basic and applied. And this is something that has to be understood and respected by both communities. Um, I'm going to be using uh, examples from research, from teaching and from professional development now for the second part. So we're moving now to the second part. Okay, the, the slightly worrying or even alarming parts of what I had to say is now, are now done, because I'm now going to focus on the deepening of the relationship between the two communities. The examples I have from research, from teaching, and from professional development. And do, you can actually look, when you look at the top 
right of the screen, you can actually see what we are in case you're lost in the list, in a long list of examples that they have for the next 15 or 20 minutes. Um, so I will be, if, if I take us back to the 1990s to to date, um, we see, I'm going to try to trace the evolution of collaborative research between the two communities. Tonight, of course, it's about celebrating the work that we've been doing here at UEA. So most of the examples are going to be about the work we've been doing here. But somehow, and in, I think in a very coherent way, they mirror some of the developments out there. So, of course, it's about celebrating the work that we have been doing here in the RME group. A lot of, this, of these studies that I'm going to be mentioning, for example, have been done with Paolo Giannone from the School of Education, but also with many um, other colleagues um, who some of them actually are in, in, in this room. And I want us to focus on perhaps and celebrate on what UEA has achieved in these years as well. You know, how we have been allowed to develop something which was for the university quite new um, at the time. Um, I'm going to go a little bit further back before my arrival here, which as said was in 1998. So the tracing of the development would be from studies of university mathematics students learning or particular mathematical topics, and we'll see a couple of examples all the way back to 96 from my doctoral thesis, to progressively shifting focus on university mathematics teachers' perspectives and practices, both in mathematics and in mathematics teaching. I will mention an example from my work with Barbara Zaworski, who is now in Loughborough University. To more recent and more specialized studies of a smaller grain size, because our field is becoming more and more specialized as we move on, and in parallel, um, systematic engagement and development of university mathematics education level theory. So, um, if we go back to um, my doctoral study at, at Oxford, um, I looked at the novice mathematician's encounter with mathematical abstraction, a mouthful title, tensions and concept image construction and formalization. What uh, was relatively new at the time was close systematic quite lengthy study of, we had 200 hours of recordings of one-to-one -one tutorials with 20 undergraduates at Oxford in a range of topics. You can see that analysis, calculus, topology, linear algebra, and group theory. And through a detailed analysis of their interactions with the tutors, came up with a pretty solid set of findings regarding their understanding and sometimes the difficulties within each one of these mathematical topics. Across those topics, there were some themes that had to do with their engagement more widely. And concept image construction and formalization came out as the two large themes around which the difficulties of the students were revolving um, in these five areas. So quite a detailed analysis of topic by topic and then cross topic um, of their experience in, in year one. Just the flavor of findings, just to give you the sense of the the, the elaborate findings that came out of this kind of work, which is quite characteristic of the kind of work that was happening in the 1990s in math education at the time. This is a paper, again, in educational studies and mathematics that came out into, in the year 2000. Don't, you don't need to engage with the group theory elements in there. Um, it's, it's just listing the kinds of difficulties with the particular mathematical area that students had, encounter, had at the time. Um, progressively shifting the focus on university mathematics teachers and the practices was the necessary implication from a close study of the students' learning because a lot of the things that the thesis was about had to do with the way they were interacting with the tutors and the teachers there. So this study was led, uh, funded by the, uh, the ESSC and led by Barbara Zaworski at Oxford. That was my postdoctoral study there just before I came here, um, which actually was followed by the work with um, Paola Genone, which was funded by the Higher Education Academy and the Maths Stats and uh, Operational Research Network soon after. Um, the focus was on teachers' perspectives. And we, with Barbara, we came up with what we now call the spectrum of pedagogical awareness, which is sort of a developmental set of stages trying to trace how mathemat mathematicians actually engage with the teaching, what perspectives they bring to it, what kind of beliefs, what kind of knowledge, and what kind of practices. Um, in the work that I'm mostly discussing in amongst mathematicians, there are five key research characteristics of the kind of work that over the years we are finding works better as in the deepening of the relationship between the two communities. 
So the five key characteristics that I'm actually writing about in, the, in that paper in Educational Studies in Mathematics that came out last night, um, collaborative, mathematically focused, context specific, non-prescriptive and non-deficit. I would like to put the emphasis on the last two because they are the ones that actually perhaps need more work on. We are not offering quick fix solutions to pedagogical problems and we are not in the blaming game. This is not the type of research that we're engaging in uh, that actually puts the blame on anybody about whether, whether, they're not, whether or not they're doing the job right in teaching. And that is something that over the years, I think it has been coming across quite strongly, quite clearly with most of the uh, colleagues who have been participating in our research. Um, just a flavor of findings from, um, from chapter four from amongst mathematicians. These are um, five of the themes that have been the focus. Actually, these are the themes that more, more or less determine the findings in many of the chapters in the book. Uh, Conquering the genre speech of university mathematics, difficulties with symbolization, premature compression of mathematical language, issues of visualization and verbalization. Just to give you a flavor, and as I said again, you do not, honestly, you do not have to engage with any of the, uh, of the mathematics in, on this slide. Um, we're now moving in the, especially in the 2000s onwards, we're moving to, towards more recent studies of a smaller grain size. What I've described so far, you, you may say, my goodness, this is about all kinds of difficulties students may be having, all kinds of issues teachers may have when they teach maths. I think I would like to mention two doctoral theses, one by Marius Ioan in 2012, who used Anas Fad's cognitive analysis, uh, cognitive theory to analyze data from a particular area of mathematics in quite a lot of depth in the way the students are actually engaging with this topic. And the current, um, I promise Athena, that there's going to be a line <laughs> in this um, for, for the work we're doing together now using Anas Fad's theory, the cognitive theory, um, to analyze students' participation in the discourses of university mathematics. In this case, analyzing closed book examination tasks. So we're hoping to produce detailed analysis of how the students engage with the exam tasks we give them and how that influences the way they study mathematics from day one. Smaller grain size is the key word here because for me this is a sign of maturity, the fact that we're now specialized enough to be able to go into much more depth <coughs> into each one of those topics. I think Emily and daughter actually didn't like that, for that second part of the, <laughs> of the talk and she's, uh, she started crying. Um, so finally, the final example from research and for this, for this part of the talk is what I mentioned be, uh, before, a systematic engagement with theory. I'm gonna mention a special issue that will be produced out of the work of many years with a group of people that, whose names you're going to see in a minute as the, working, the thematic working group for the European Research and Mathematics Education Conference. We started in 2011, 13, 15, and now we have a special issue um, in research and mathematics education on institutional, social, cultural, and discursive approaches to research in university mathematics education. So development of how, how can we bring theories from, not just from mathematics education, but from other disciplines as well, into analyzing the teaching and learning of maths. I'm not going to bore you with what each one of the theories says. It's too late in the evening for that. Um, but I would uh, need to say that this is, for me, this is part of a dream team of people from five different countries and we've been working really closely and we're hoping to do a lot more work in this area as well. Crucially, the point of this work is that how can these different theoretical approaches offer complementary, overlapping, in some, some, some cases diverging or even incommensurable lenses on UME, University Math Education Research Questions. This is one of the things that has brought it together and we're trying to, in, to in investigate as we speak. Uh, so I'm going to move now to examples from teaching. In order to do what? To trace the evolution of collaboration between the two communities towards two goals, a more inclusive approach to mathematics education models in mathematics programs and to engaging mathematics educators with teaching mathematics modules. Um, one of the two things I think we do better at UEA than the other one. Um, there are two models, one of them led by Paola Genone and the other one led by, by myself. Uh, the learning and teaching of maths and the children teachers in mathematics changing public perceptions of mathematics. 
that I think have been attracting increasing number of students. We've been doing, I think, well in helping students from both the School of Education and Mathematics to engage with them. About the second one, I will say a few more words because I have, there is a particular agenda relating to the bringing of the two communities together related to this module, and I think I will be almost closing tonight with re referencing that. The other one, engaging mathematics education researchers with teaching mathematics modules, I think we have very good examples of that happening in places like Loughborough, which has a mathematics education center. One of our colleagues here, Irene Biz, actually came from, from Loughborough, where researchers in math education have to do some mathematics teaching, so that keeps them really closely and very deeply engaged with the mathematics throughout. Um, but we do have modules here. There is a problem-solving module that Paula Yelena has been involved, so we do a little, a little bit of that. But perhaps this, this is something to, to discuss a bit more in, um, uh, in the future. A bit about professional development now. That's my next example. Um, okay, there's a slightly thorny issue. Um, when I first came to UEA and I was trained as a new lecturer, I noticed that there was not a, very, not a lot of discipline-specific training. Um, in fact, quite a bit of it I thought it was not very relevant. And I thought, well, perhaps it would be more appealing if it was more specific to the discipline that I, I came here to do research and teaching in. And I think that is actually starting to happen a little bit more. Um, I'm going to mention, for example, the proof guide, something that Paolo Yanan and I worked on a few years back with funding from the Higher Education Academy, trying to help colleagues in the School of Maths to teach and approach this particular, particularly difficult subject in, uh, in math teaching. Uh, but also I would like to mention a module on, in our MA Higher Education Practice uh, program. It's called the Evaluative Conversation, and I've had a really enjoyed um, working with new lecturers in mathematics on having deep conversations about the first experiences of teaching at university level. And that's been quite an, um, an enjoyable and, for me, meaningful opportunity uh, to work with colleagues from the School of Maths. So, here is part two, examples from research, from teaching and from professional development. And I would like now to uh, move on to the last part of the, of the discussion of the, of the lecture for, uh, for tonight. And mention a few examples of initiatives from where the two communities have been working together towards the strengthening of another fragile yet very crucial relationship, that of the public with mathematics. So I'm going to be mentioning a couple of examples from research and development activity teaching mathematics to non-mathematics students. So we're now beginning to see a little bit of the future as well here, because these are kind of relatively new projects that um, I've been involved in. Teaching of mathematics in school, and in the second area of teaching about mathematics to non-mathematics students, and thirdly, engagement activities. So research and development, a couple of examples, teaching about mathematics to non-mathematics students, and engagement activity, raising public awareness and appreciation for maths. Um, first one, research and development work into the teaching of mathematics to non-mathematics students. There is an emerging collaboration, and um, I did warn Robert that there was a, a reference to this um, new initiative at UEA. Several schools at UEA, quite a few of them actually, teach mathematics and quite a few students are facing quite substantial difficulties with that experience. Um, we now have a group, and members of the RME group, including Paolo Yanon and Irene Ibiza, we are members of that emerging uh, initiative, and we're hoping that we're going to be doing some research and development work in this direction. So for me, this is another, this is starting to open up opportunities that go beyond the teaching of mathematics to mathematics students, which has been the focus of most of my work so far. And I would like to, to, um, to mention another emerging collaboration with um, colleagues from France, from the Netherlands, and from Norway. This is a quite new development. It has actually come out of the collaboration through the European Research for Mathematics Education that I, um, I mentioned before. And I'm quite excited about this opportunity because what we were hoping to achieve is to bring three communities together. So yeah, the two became three school mathematics teachers, university lecturers in mathematics, 
and researchers in mathematics education to achieve what? To achieve a better communication and dialogue about what, how we should prepare students for what mathematics may be at university and potentially make mathematics more appreciated, more enjoyed, more desirable to students in school. So that is actually an initiative um, that we do know that anything that has to do with the research council funding has about between 7 and 10% rate of success, but we are hopeful that perhaps we have a, a, a serious case to make. One thing I would like to say is that Eindhoven in the Netherlands is like something like the Silicon Valley in, in California. They, they have very strong links with the uh, IT industries, innovation technology, and they're incredibly keen on improving the appreciation of mathematics in, in school students because this is where they recruit most of the big um, and creative brains. Um, so this is just one of the initiatives I would like to mention in the way of looking into the future. Um, I would like to mention a study, a set of studies, a series of studies that actually has come out of the, the very obvious, one may say, connection between the relationship that young people have with mathematics from when they're in school. Um, it's a pleasure to see my colleague Susan Stewart being actually in the audience here because my first contact with research with um, uh, mathematics teachers um, was through the disaffection study that we conducted about 10, 12 years ago. The study I'm going to mention tonight has been going on for about 10 years as well and using situation-specific tasks, which is largely the methodology we have, we, we used um, for the study that led to amongst mathematicians, to do what? To trigger teacher reflection on some of the key issues that have been emerging from our studies in a number of years, and have highlighted the, the, huge, the hugely important role that teachers play in the way that students, young people actually relate to mathematics. So, one big topic, fostering advanced mathematical thinking in the mathematics classroom. Another second big issue, the balancing act between classroom management and mathematical learning and how one interferes with the other. And thirdly, this is the latest one. Um, this is the project that Neil mentioned at the beginning in his introduction that is funded by the British Academy. It's actually in collaboration with our colleagues from uh, Brazil, the uh, University of Anangueira in Sao Paulo that actually focuses on challenging teachers' ableist perspectives on the teaching of mathematics. Where ableism is all of the kinds of preconceptions and prejudices we may have about who is able or not able in mathematics. The particular focus of the project, this small slice of what we hope is going to be a much bigger project, is on blind and deaf learners. Uh, and it is, again, it's a pleasure to see Mr. Malcolm Sinclair, who is one of our uh, collaborators from um, from the CAP team project to be here. So, inclusion in mathematics, teaching, balancing act between management and learning, and what my PhD supervisor calls mathematical challenge, fostering advanced mathematical thinking in the classroom. Three quite large issues. We're calling the project Transforming Aspirations into Strategies in Context, because it's most of the work that we have done has led us to the conclusion that it's more, not so much about what people aspire to do. Usually they come out of, for example, our PGC program with huge aspirations and a very idealistic perspective on how mathematics teaching can be, how this translates into something that is doable and effective in the classroom. Um, so far we have been involving about 350 mathematics teachers from around the world because we've been doing this with different colleagues uh, in different countries. It's led by Irene Bizain in the School of Education. Um, and you notice the word tasks, you see the title. We didn't have a logo, we're trying to think <coughs> of, a, of a proper acronym and this is what we came up with. Can you see the link? It's, it's a little bit of a visual <laughs> game there <laughs> with what, what, how TASIC became TASC. Uh, we're quite hopeful and we may be able to develop actually an impact case study given the number of teachers involved uh, for the next REF uh, or perhaps the, the one after that, we'll see. So, um, our other example is about teaching, well, teaching about mathematics to non-mathematics students. And it is a 
pleasure to see some of my BA students here who are doing this module and they are surviving. It's week six and they're surviving this module. Children, teachers and mathematics, changing public perceptions of mathematics. Uh, and it is a project that actually, it is a, it, it's a module that tries to put together some of the research I've been doing into the public representations, uh, the, the representations in popular culture and in the media of mathematics and mathematicians. We have quite a, um, a quite tough and long list of aims in this module. We're, but we are going to be dealing. We're dealing with, well, one of the most important yet notoriously feared and misunderstood subject, mathematics. We aim to share some of the excitement, but also face some of the challenges that come with the teaching and learning of maths. We investigate where the social and psychological stigma of mathematics comes from the fear that prevents many adults and children from building a good relationship with mathematics. We juxtapose this stigma with results from neuroscience as well that show that mathematical thinking is quite natural. In fact, mathematical ability is innate to all human beings. And I'm, I will be trying to convince the students with the research evidence of that in the coming weeks. We also juxtapose these research findings with examples from popular culture, TV, films, pop music, mostly films because as people know, I'm, I am a film buff and the arts that seem to perpetuate largely mathophobic images. Mathophobia is a word that's with us since 1954. It's the first evidence we have of mathophobia being written up in, uh, in research. We consider how education, particularly in the crucial years of primary school, can work against the tide of such images and introduce children to the creativity and excitement of mathematics. It's quite a lot to pack into one single module but I think we're getting there. Um, and finally, examples of public engagement activities. Oh, there's a C missing there. Uh, that aim to draw non-mathematical audiences into the world of mathematics and into considering the possibility of mathematical studies. I'm really happy to, to, to be able to say that MOD, our maths at uni days, they started in 2006 with a UEA teaching fellowship um, collaboratively carried out with uh, colleagues from the, the School of Mathematics and the Further Mathematics Center. Every July, we have a day of events where kids from around Norfolk and Suffolk, they come over here and they just see what it means to be a mathematician, what mathematicians do. Um, we have activities, we have problem solving, we have lectures, we have a panel of professionals uh, from not just teaching and university research to talk to the um, well, potential applicants to UEA or perhaps potential mathematicians uh, to discuss the possibility of the importance and appeal of mathematics as well as the capacity to open windows to a wide range of professions. Um, so, I've bombarded you with all sorts of examples, activities, things that we have been doing. I've been doing for about 20 years, we've been doing for almost 20 years here at UEA. And I'll just close with a very brief thought. Can this story of mathematicians and mathematics education researchers intersecting at various points in research, in teaching, in professional development, and in public engagement activities, can we reimagine that story as not just the story of paths crossing, where people cross and then they go the different ways, but actually as a story of paths meeting at a vanishing point. Eventually, these communities may actually merge and their interests become more or less congruent. In fact, the differences even maybe recede completely. So I'm going to thank you for your attention this Tuesday evening and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Hello everyone. Um, I'm Nalini Boudou. I'm head of the School of Education and Lifelong Learning. Um, I'd like to thank Eleanor for a very enlightening lecture. Eleanor, I'm impressed by what you managed to convey in such a short space of twi time. 20 years of work, essentially. So well done on doing that. That's really very, very impressive. Um, I've known Eleanor for around 15 years because we've been at UEA for around the same amount of time. Um, across the last five years, I've been her head of school and I know well how driven she is and what her work ethic is exactly. And I think it came across in the amount that was covered through um, her presentation. That work ethic, I know, led Eleanor to spend a considerable amount of time 
considering how to make this inaugural lecture accessible, especially to people like me who are non-mathematicians. Um, yes, not an expert in the field, so thank you for having made it accessible. And also stimulating. Um, I hope the hardcore mathematicians who are here have not been disappointed because it didn't include complex equations and so on, and other things that I don't know about. I also want to say, Eleanor, I know that various members of your family endeavoured to present um, to you what you should present this evening too. So perhaps I should extend thanks to, I know one member of the family in particular, but knowing Eleanor, all of this was her own work. <laughs> um, whilst accessible, I believe that the lecture has also challenged our thinking. Um, challenging is something that Eleanor does particularly well. She sets out to do that with her colleagues and also with her students. Um, questions will come in a moment from you, but I just want to say what I take from the lecture this evening. For me, Eleanor, the possible challenges that resonate with my field, for those of you that don't know, um, I'm a linguist. I also have an interest in um, education and development. It is this issue of how do we deepen the relationship between the subject specialist working here in, in the maths department and uh, educators. I'm also a teacher educator. That intersection is very fragile. I'm not aware that it exists in any other areas of work to any great degree. So I do think this is pretty groundbreaking work that you're doing. Certainly in terms of linguists and um, MFL, modern foreign language teachers, as I say, I'm not aware that that intersection leads to quality relationships which can move the field forward in terms of, for example, a large part of the work of the School of Education teacher education and training teachers, or as I like to say, the education of teachers. So that, Eleanor, for me is um, a very important aspect that you've made me reflect on. Um, and related to this is the scope of the work that might come from such collaborations. It's certainly making me think um, I need to go out there and do some work with people in HUM who are working as linguists and so on. Um, so, yes, there was yes. an impetus now for me to go out and do that and cool. try and um, emulate some of mm -hmm. this work that you've been doing. But I'm going to stop talking at this point and ask for questions from the audience. There are some mics, so if you would wait for the mic to reach you, um, we'll take some questions. Jeff? Yeah. Hello, you. You're Joe. Okay, um. Jeff. Thanks very much for the talk. Um, I was just wondering whether um, math mathematics, um, to me, who, like Nalini, is a non-mathematician, just seems a vast area. And, and yet, um, I am I'm acutely conscious of the fact that I ought to know more about mathematics. Um, and I was just wondering, in terms of confronting this ableist perspective mm. that you mentioned, whether there are say certain areas of mathematics which which non-mathematicians could could pick up relatively easy so that mathematics just doesn't become this huge blob called mathematics but becomes divided up into things that oh yeah i do know a little bit about that is it possible to divide the field up so that it becomes something graspable and is that something that at all you're engaged in in, in, in your researches well I have my own favourites, but we, we have quite a few colleagues from the School of Mathematics if they would like to help me with uh, responding to that, that question. For me, a good start is number theory, because you can actually start from something that people have immediate, tangible understanding of, and it quite quickly becomes very abstract and gives you opportunity to actually go into some complex but really satisfying proofs. But would the colleagues from the School of Mathematics perhaps um, have a... A more qualified response, yeah? Uh, thank you. Uh, I would just say there are some excellent popular mathematics books. Um, books by um, Ian Stewart, uh, Marcus de Sotoy, um, Richard Elways. And people have done this work. I mean, it's out there. Yeah. It's not as well known as it might be, but it's, it, it does exist. Yes. Um, 
Yes. So, list of references? Do we do reading list after this after the lectures? Yes. <laughs> the, the, the other thing that I'd say is, of, of course, I mean, do you enjoy doing Sudoku? That's mathematics. It's not arithmetic, but it's mathematics. Yeah. There are lots of things, lots, lots of logical logic puzzles and so on. That, that's all mathematics. So. Same, same. Thing. <laughs> Kathleen, yes. I think there's a mic coming your way. Yes. Thank you so much. Eleanor, uh, this is to do with my interest in history as well as cross-cultural matters. Is it a particularly Western phenomenon that people can grow up feeling math-phobic? To the best of your, I mean, for instance, um, from my knowledge of aspects of Indian culture, mathematicians, uh, maths has a very long and extraordinary history within India. I can't speak for cultures such as Japan, etc. But I'm just curious, is this a particularly, a particular handicap for us in the West? It seems to be perhaps more <coughs> intense or more intensely uh, evidenced. Um, in Europe and North America, um, perhaps because more research, more detailed research has been made into it, has been done into it. But there is something that um, in the, um, the talk I mentioned before in Oberwolf in Germany last year, people did ask me, frankly, is this a British problem? <laughs> more than a European or a Western problem. Because this, this seems to be a particularly problematic flawed relationship with maths in, in Britain, perhaps a bit more than in other uh, parts of Europe. We can have a quite lengthy conversation about the reasons behind that, um, but I think you probably have heard the often rehearsed argument that people are feeling quite comfortable with acknowledging in public that they're not good at maths, even in basic uh, numeracy, but no, very few people would actually be comfortable in admitting that they cannot read. So literacy and numeracy seem to be um, uh, suffering dif at different levels, you know, in, in, within, within Britain particularly. We do have the fact that we actually have a, an entire module on our BA program on mathophobia, I think says something, that we have to actually have the conversation about why it is important to have a good relationship with maths, why it's an enjoyable, rewarding, as well as important relationship to have. So yes, we can... And there is quite a lot of research, not so much about it. The cultural and historical roots of mathematics are everywhere. There's not a single culture in, this, in, in the world that actually that hasn't given us some mathematics. But the way mathematics is being experienced and related to in different parts of the world does differ quite a lot. Thank you. I think we probably have time for one more question. Ralph? Maybe. Yeah, thanks, Ralph Manning. And uh, this follows on from the last comment you just dealt with. I, I'd be interested to know about the TASIC project. You talk about the ableist perspective. Yes. Um, and, and that, to me, as a person from primary education background, seems to be a, a, a huge uh, stopping point for the math phobics. It seems to be that from a very early, early opportunity, teachers tend to take an ableist approach mm -hmm. to uh, their children. And that often ingrains a view on mathematics which goes then right through yes. uh, a child's education. So uh, uh, is that part of the, the remit of that group to, to look at the primary perspective? Yes. Uh, uh, at the moment we've been working mostly with secondary mathematics teachers both in Brazil and, and here in the UK. But we're hoping, we're currently writing the, uh, the grant application for uh, the larger project. And we're certainly hoping, quite a few of our findings are actually saying that we should be working with primary teachers as well. So definitely preconceptions about who has mathematical ability and who hasn't do start quite early. And this is one of the, the, mo the, the most sore points, actually, of the, of the rather you know, flawed relationship with mathematics that I described. Absolutely. I agree with you, Ralph. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I think we're going to give Eleanor a break now. <laughs>